Cast to 92 countries. <laughs> yeah, I think we're live. Yes, we are live. And uh, good evening, everyone. Um, tonight we're going to uh, have a little talk by my mystery guest, Lana Shaheen, who I have known for about six years. And um, Lana is an artist, and in 2015 I ran a contest on my website, archetypeinaction.com, uh, a global art contest who, for someone who could best emulate what Dr. Jung's teaching was. And I ran this on a global basis, I offered a prize, and Lana uh, won the prize. <laughs> and, and so, um, so Lana is here tonight to talk about her drawing and, um, and also tell us her story. And so I'm going to, uh, un unusual as it is for this group, I'm going to Excuse me. Bless you. Bless you. I, I'm going to show Lana's face. <laughs> yeah, we, we'd like to edit that out, but anyway. So. It's a broadcast. So late. This is uh, uh, Lana Shaheen. So we have nobody here right now, so I'm, I am going to edit this part. Yeah, good. Good. <laughs> except, except uh, <laughs> nobody here. Okay, can you... Right. Do you want me to edit this to, so I can do something about this? What do you want to do? Okay, yep, we can do that. Very good. Yeah, perfect. Better. Okay. So. You um, learned something from. So I'm going to introduce you again since yeah. there's nobody here. Okay. And I, except our friends here. But there's nobody here, so I'm going to cut this part out. <laughs> yeah, and you're going to introduce me. <laughs> Including. <laughs> Including the, including the sneeze, and now we have one visitor on YouTube, and so I'm going to edit the sneeze out, I'm going to introduce Lana once again. So this is uh, session number 137 of the Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group, and I have sitting next to me Lana Shaheen, who in 2015 won the fifth anniversary art contest that I conducted for the archetypeinaction.com website. And so she has her drawing that she did and she's going to tell us her story. So, finally. Yeah, finally. <laughs> yeah okay. So, uh, first of all, thank you all for having me today and thank you, Skep, for this. Um, my name is Lana Shaheen and I'm an artist from um, Gaza, Palestine. Um, so, um, this summer I had the chance to be an intern with Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Um, and, you know, like, I feel like Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, she's having the same story of me, like a story of getting our, our voice heard or something like this. So, um, first of all, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, speak a little bit about how I met Skeb. Um, for the first time, um, it was like in 2014, we had a war in Gaza, and um, in this war I was um, writing uh, some articles and drawing and sharing my articles online. So um, Skip was one of the people that, you know, like I got connected by Skip, uh, by someone, um, um, Melton. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, she um, just connected me to Skeb, and then um, Skeb um, just shared my um, artwork and my writings on his uh, website. And this, uh, um, after this, like um, um, I was like participating in. Um, um, I I got a prize award uh, from Skeb's um, website, and. This was the piece 
this was um, the, the winning drawing. Oh yeah, this was the winning uh, drawni, uh, drawing uh, that I won. And it was a drawing to reflect um, Carl Jung's work. Yeah. That was the idea. But the idea that I didn't know that much about Jung, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea was that my unconscious made me draw this. And when Skip just saw this piece, he was like, wow, how did you do this? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, um, I don't know. And I started to explain. So for me, I feel like this circle is the earth. This is the earth. And, you know, like today we have like the nature is being killed to have our lives. And this is the truth uh, of uh, that like we're not getting that much um, care of the nature anymore. We kill many trees because we need babies. We, we, we kill animals because we... And this is the truth about like the nature is getting worse. And I always feel like the hidden part underground, this is the part that no one care about. This is like the part that everyone should learn that much about because you know you know sometimes like I can feel like these things under the, the ground it's the only thing which make the tree so tall and so strong sometimes and this is the, the, the same way with with a human we do a lot of things underground no one knows about this but people see the success and the power and the strength so, um, yeah, the giraffe is, the, the giraffe, sorry, <laughs> I always say the giraffe, you know, this is the problem of having English as my second language. <laughs> yeah, the giraffe is um, a symbol of nature. And yeah, so after I met Skip, <clears throat> excuse me, after I met Skip, Skip said that this is the Mandela. And I started to know about like, oh, this circle is the Mandela of the earth, of everything. So um, I started to learn more about Young. I started to learn more about like these stuff. And I was really shocked that, oh, I did something unconsciously, but it happened because our unconscious is so connected to religion somehow. So um, this is my first time meeting Skeb in Washington, DC. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so fun. <laughs> yeah. We um, came up to each other. And we, we were did this. we were d doing this. Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> so we were like, um, I, I wasn't believing this. I was telling Skip that miracles could could happen sometimes. I I didn't expect to get out from Gaza to the USA directly and meet Skip after many years. We were like talking online and then I met him and I haven't. Um, so yeah, as I said, um, I'm interning with Congresswoman Ilhan Omar and she's so very cute. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, she's an inspiration to me, to be honest. And What's her name again? Ilhan Omar. Oh, yeah, she's, she's actually much older here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. She's yeah, she's a kid. <laughs> so, before you showed that, I'll tell the Ilhan story. Yeah. So, so I was, I was um, having, I had my speech um, like four weeks ago uh, in the Congress, and Congresswoman Ilhan Omar introduced me, yeah. and... And so Ilhan Omar gets up and... She says, well, I've been checking out Lana's uh, Instagram account, and Lana's what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> yeah. Which was really cute. Yeah. Um, my art. <laughs> yeah. So, Go ahead. yeah, during my speech in the Congress, I, I just explained two things about these two pieces. That I'm so hopeful sometimes, but I'm, I have the real truth behind my, my life and my experience and the suffering that I had in my, in my life in Gaza and everything else. Yeah, this is the sunflower. <laughs> so
so um, I was telling them that the sunflower is so connected to my childhood. My mom was telling me a mystery about the sunflower. So the fact that I believed in that the sunflower is a woman. She's a woman with a yellow hair, a golden hair. And this woman was waiting for Apollo, um, the, god of, uh, the god of the sun, Apollo. And she was waiting since like the morning until uh, uh, and, um, leading the sun from the east to the west. And she was waiting in the ground just to give him the beauty when he looks down. And she, then she gave up and Apollo, like she was in love with Apollo, but Apollo didn't fall in love with her. And unfortunately she died standing on the ground just because she wants to give him the beauty whenever he looks down. So this sunflower, I believe that the sunflower is a woman. And I always say the sunflower is me. The sunflower is my mom, my grandmother. Um, we are standing just to give the beauty of the other people, the woman, the power of the woman. And I always say that one woman can change, a world, can change the world. So one, more woman, can, can, one woman can do any, anything for the world. Um, because we're strong enough, no one believes in us sometimes, but we have the power. <laughs> we do. So I painted this piece in 2017, and it was a part of my first gallery, which called Faceless Humanity. And, you know, the sunflower is a woman. <laughs> and um, this piece um, goes to Congresswoman Ilhan Omar <laughs> as a gift. And, yeah. So this is one of my hopeful paintings that I really love um, to talk about because, you know, it's so connected to my mother and my mother was telling me about this mystery. Whenever, whenever she asked me, Lana, what do you want to be when you, grow, when you grow up? And I was like, I want to be a sunflower. And she was like, okay. <laughs> and I was like, okay, you told me the story and now I'm so obsessed with the sunflowers. So um, this piece is Kip's favorite piece. And for me, I see like these eyes are my mother's eyes when she gave me the last hug before I leave Gaza. And I don't want to get emotional now. Um, and I can say that these eyes, these are the eyes of my grandmother when she was looking at her father and her um, and her mother hanged on the wall where, where they were shot in their heads um, in uh, 1948 so I see like the eyes oh like always I dream of my mother's eyes I dream with the eyes I don't know why but the eyes is like I, I always use the eyes in my in my paintings but this piece it has a name and Skippy, can you t can you tell them a, a little bit about the name of this of this piece well lana had a very complicated name for this piece and her complicated name was war will end and the governor will make peace but the mother of the martyr will keep waiting and um so i suggested a simpler name which is the martyr's mother kept the governor waiting at the peace ceremony. Yeah. And um, so now this piece sits above my desk um, at home. Yeah, yeah, because Lana gifted it to me. And, and <laughs> yeah. so here's, so anyway, this is Lana um, giving her talk at the congressional forum. And what was the context? Uh, was that the was like four weeks ago. Yeah. Well, it was in the Rayburn building. Yeah. It was one of the big meeting rooms. Yeah. Why, why, why were they meeting? Um, it well, was. They were meeting to uh, hear f the speeches from the yeah. eight participants in Some her participants program. From the Middle East. Yeah. 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 <coughs> yeah. yeah. They're. they're 
There were eight interns yeah. in, this summer, okay, mm -hmm. and Lana was one, so she was, she was assigned to Ilhan Omar. There was another one assigned to Rashida <laughs> Taleb. Yeah. <laughs> and the, yeah. <laughs> and one of them was, uh, she was with AOC. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So That's that was incredible. <laughs> yeah, sure. Right. Okay. So, um, I... I believe that art is my identity and this is the only thing that I can say about like my identity. Art is my identity and I feel that, that like without art, I don't know if I can survive <laughs> because you know whenever you feel something inside you need to get it out somehow and I, I see that. I see that most of the characters that I, I draw or I paint in my in my pieces, they are someone who I dreamed of or someone who who was in my nightmare or whatever. In the last period, I was super sick. I had, yeah, sick. Yeah. sick. Uh, I had many panic attacks because I'm so traumatized of the three wars. And, you know, I lost one of my friends and... Um, in the March of Britain, uh, he's, um, he was a journalist and he was wearing his press suit, but unfortunately a sniper killed him by um, shooting him in his waist. Unfortunately, he was like, he was killed before he finished his documentary about the Gazan people. Um, Yasser was one of the people who inspired me to study journalism and I'll always say that Yasser is one of the inspirational people in my life. And I'll keep talking about him until my death <laughs> because he changed something in me. I was super traumatized when I, and I, when I heard um, that he, he got killed. And the same night he, he was injured, he got killed in the same night. And I was like crying so crazy. I was telling my mom like, I cannot believe this because he was one of the people who helped me to have my first, um, my first gallery's video. Uh, he and Hassan Salim and these like friends that I'll never forget about them. Um, so, you know, like losing someone because of the war is, isn't something that easy and uh, after like um, getting out from Gaza like one we uh, one year ago I'm not allowed now to see my family again it's not easy to get back to Gaza I need a permission and this permission is not gonna get like I'm, I'm not gonna have this permission easily and unfortunately um, my young sister now is growing up and I don't see her like everything is, is a changing and my my family is a changing my dad is changing he's growing up as well and everyone is growing up and you don't even know um, when will you meet your family again so these things just um, made me so traumatized and in the last period I had attacks and I was like seeing myself dying my body is reacting in a very different way for the first time and I think I was so strong in the beginning, but now I can't handle the things anymore. And yeah, um, so hopefully one day it's, it's, we will have like something to get better in the future. But now I feel that one of my duties is to share my story as I believe that sh the story can change the world and by sharing my story so I, I let someone know what does it mean to live in the siege in Gaza what does it mean to lose, to lose one of my friends what does it mean to see my family they are not able to get out from Gaza what does it mean to to suffer and to live three wars and one rebellion. So most of the people don't even know that Gaza is, is on the map, you know. But now one of my duties as I get out from this prison, I have to say 
my story. I have to tell the world about my story. And I, I need, I have to do, I have to do this. Um, and yeah, that's it. Big jail now. Okay. You cannot, you, you're not allowed to go out. You're not allowed to enter Gaza. You need a permission to go out. You need permission to, go, to get out, uh, to get inside and to get out. So you either stuck inside or you either stuck outside. So, uh, yeah, I, I didn't see my family since one year now, and I don't know when I'm going to see them again. Yeah. And you have brothers and sisters? I have six sisters, no brothers. And, um, and you're the oldest? Uh, I'm the second one of the oldest. Okay. Yeah. You know, like, um, my oldest sister, she's in Gaza, and me, I travel. Then I have three of my sisters that are studying medicine in Egypt. And I have, um, after them, I have two sisters that are still with my family in Gaza. So we should talk about this piece. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this piece, it's called The Only Thing Making Evil Occupy Us is the Silence of Goodness. Yeah, so what I see in this piece is like, Sometimes when we are, like, you know, do you know, like, um, we have something in Arabic says that, <laughs> I don't know how to translate this, but it says, <laughs> 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 like, uh, sorry, <laughs> which means that um, when, when you have someone who has the power and everyone is saying, yeah, you're right, you're right. And then you finally end up that this man is getting the power from the people, not from himself. And not because he deserved the power, not because he's so powerful, but because the people around him is shutting their mouths and they don't speak the truth. So yeah, whenever, whenever we have someone in power and everyone is saying, yeah, you're right, um, then this powerful a place is turning to an evil place. Evil. Turning into an evil place. Yeah. So they start to use their power against you because you're saying, yeah, I accept. Yeah, I agree. I don't mind. Um, so I believe that whenever you feel that like sometimes we don't believe in ourselves. We say, oh, I cannot change this, but I can believe that the individual can change a lot. The individual can change a lot, a lot of things. So whenever you believe that you have to say the truth, then you as an individual, you're doing something for yourself, for your family, for your people, for everyone. But if you just keep shutting your mouth and agree, agree like if you agree um, by saying yeah then it means that it turns to a so yeah this is my turns point to, of view turns to evil, to evil can you yeah. open this because yeah sure we had a few comments for you but, um, um, but anyway keep going yeah so um, this is my story so any any thoughts any thoughts <laughs> what, what, I have a question, Lana. What is the, is that wood pieces in the face there? Or what is? Oh, yeah. This is like a, a prison, a jail. Oh, okay. I don't know if you can see it, but I use, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, um, I paint an abstract. I, I belong to, to the abstract art. So I cannot draw the things as it is. I just throw the vision in, in, inside my mind. So um, this is something, yeah, a prison, you know, like you're shutting yourself because you're, you're locked somehow. And this is like a kind of a fire or something. And you keep like, yeah. And you keep, si you keep like your silence without doing anything. You're accepting the darkness. You're accepting everything without doing anything because you don't believe that you can change something. And this is the truth. So the fact that it's shaped like a head means something, right? Oh yeah, okay. this is the head. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love ears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, any questions? Well, yeah, I don't want to sound too weird, but uh, so you say um, a lot of your images have eyes in them. A lot of images what? have eyes in them, like your mom's eyes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. When you're uh, when you're about going about, do you do you think do you feel like there's eyes with you or do you just oh yeah i feel that you know i always say like whenever i draw something i bought an eye and i but not not that usual but i use the eyes a lot because i feel that someone is following me i don't know why okay. but this is what i feel and well, I just wondered because of the yeah, time I've had night, night yeah, case. yeah. I I always feel like somebody's somebody's following me, and I I hate the dark. I have phobia from darkness, dark dark places. Yeah, and I I have like um, a lot of nightmares because I hate the night. To be honest, I hate the night. And so, how young were you when you first feel like you were traumatized by this whole? Thing? Um. It started after the last war, and especially after, like, I I remember I had the sleep paralysis. I don't know if you know about the sleep paralysis, but the sleep paralysis is kind of like you're awake, but you cannot move your body, and your brain is working. You can see, yes, you can see yourself in the room, and you open your eyes, and see everything, recognize everything around you, but sometimes you see someone from your gym in your room, and it, it's so scary. So it's, you spend like about five minutes in this situation. And I was like, I remember the first time it happens in Gaza, but I had these in the last period a lot because I, I was like talking a lot about the conflict, about Gaza, about my family, about like, missing my friends and everyone. So, um, um, yeah, I have a lot of problems. It's getting better? It's getting better because now I'm, I'm doing a lot of meditations and, um, you know, like, I'm trying to heal myself and to give my body, like, a chance to heal itself by itself. I'm sorry, I've been silent here. I'm trying to bring up the chat because you have a <laughs> yeah, number sure. of comments here. Here we go. Uh, so, Grace Soul says, Hi Lana, your sunflower is beautiful. Uh, Jerome says, Congratulations Lana, your art speaks volumes. Yes, your story can change the world. And Tim Holmes says, Can you please show the image to the camera for a moment so we can study it? And, oh, yeah. sure. and, Which uh, one? I'm not sure which one. And Miles says hello from Canada. So let me. This is. Let me first show the. Okay. This is the um, piece that Lana won the contest with, which shows uh, the the instinctual living side of the of the world and the dead side of the world and the uh, civilization versus natural world yeah. and. So, animals and instinct versus civilization. And then, of course, she has the mandala in it. So, all those features are certainly Jungian. <laughs> and um, so, that's one. And yeah, then, um, this is the piece that Lana has given me, uh, which is uh, the martyr's mother kept the governor waiting at the peace ceremony. <coughs> and, um, and then this one is the sunflower, <coughs> the sunflower woman. And this one is uh, the only thing making evil occupy us is the silence of goodness. And you didn't want to show the other pictures of Which us. One? No, I, I no. Okay. Show Which one? Okay. Um, no, I don't mind. Okay, so we're back. Oh yeah. And uh, 
So Lana's paintings were uh, selected to be put on posters and city buses in Jerusalem. Yeah. And so here's one on a poster, and as oh, you see, it's a, a street scene in Jerusalem. And, uh, and I'm, I'm not allowed to go there, but my pieces went there. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Where's the other one? I'm... Oh, yeah. Did, did you take them out? No, I didn't. I don't have it. Yeah, this is in Jerusalem, yeah. in the street. Could I see that heap in front of you, <laughs> Bill? Oh. Can we see this oh, yeah. group here? I'm looking for one particular image here. Um, Do you mean the bones? Is it represented in a way that you like? Yeah, yeah. Like, they were asking me, and every step, Lana, do you agree, Lana, do you not? Okay. Yeah, I want to pull those out. Well, I don't seem to have... Um, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> okay, so I neglected to bring uh, that painting, uh, those images, but uh, they actually appear on city buses in Jerusalem. Um, like one of the institutions, you can see like um, we have um, the Palestinian vision, Palestinian vision, and we have, um, I cannot read, like uh, we have four of the institutions uh, which is support the human rights and the women rights and everything about this, yeah. So wait, they begged me. I didn't know about this, but then they emailed me and they said, Lana, can we show you so, uh, your um, your artwork? Uh, yeah, as a part of... Thank you. So, um, just other comments. Miles says, hello from Canada. 100% says, an image says more than a thousand words. Thank you. Definitely yeah, in this that's case. True. Mm -hmm. um, Grace Soul says, excellent work, Lana. Tim says, thank you, Lana. Would you say the idea of sentention of opposites is a conscious path in your work? I'm not sure what the word sentention means. Does anybody know what it's... No intention. Yeah. I, I mean, do you, are you constantly, are, are you consciously putting opposites in your work? No. It's unconscious. Okay. And I don't think before I, I just paint something. Um, it's all about like what my hands do. I don't think before I just draw or paint. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to pass on one of these comments, which doesn't merit being repeated. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, so you can move over that way a little bit. Oh, yeah, and sure. I will take you <laughs> off the screen for the time being. <laughs> So, thank you, Lana, for visiting us. Now, this afternoon I did a, a brief interview with Lana about the Red Book, and so I just wanted to share a couple of things. There's a picture of the actual Red Book of C.G. Jung, which was uh, in the vault in Switzerland for um, about 40 years. And... Uh, <clears throat> Last week I showed video of uh, a German bookmaking company that is making actual new blank red books so that people could put them in. And they're handmade, so they're quite expensive. But um, on the other hand, the point of them is that they are um, a precious thing. And so... It, it, because it's uh, it comes in a box and and it's very well made, it'll become a family heirloom for people. So if if people are doing drawings or paintings about their life, uh, that's good. And so this afternoon I was also mentioning about mandalas, and so I wanted to show this image. This is the ol oldest known mandala, and it was found in a cave in Kimberley, Australia, um, and it's been dated at 50,000 years old, 50,000 years old. And 
Then I was talking about uh, the mystery of the mandalas at the bottom of the sea. So here you can see the diver, uh, and he's looking at the, at the mandala in the sand. And then I'm going to steal that other picture. Lend me that, lend me that other one just for a moment. Okay, so they found out that this mandala was being done by this puffer fish, the, the fugu fish in Japan, which is known for, creates this mandala in five days. It's seven feet in diameter. And the purpose, of, and the purpose is to get the female to lay her eggs in the middle of the mandala. And, uh, I wouldn't mind it if uh, some of my regular subscribers would uh, knock 100% off, uh, off the chat at this point. Uh, <laughs> takes all, I don't need trolls here. Um, now, I, we also have a, a guest here and she want to be heard, so. Yeah, but I'm very happy to be here. Okay, all right, so you're welcome. And so, any other thoughts here before we move on? Just uh, very refreshing to have Lana here and to show us her art and her. And the sense uh, of how you've experienced it and are experiencing it. The fact that you maintain and retain some hope and promise, you know, that you haven't been beat down by it. So. And not to be superficial, but you look really well slept. <laughs> She's also very young. Oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Is well slept a word? Anyway, it's very touching. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, so, do you have anything to do? Do you have any comments on the art? Oh, I love. I saw the a documentary of the puffer fish doing the mandala. I, uh -huh. I actually saw, saw that a on video of it. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's pretty impressive. It is. And what's to me, what's very impressive about it is that's way over 50,000 years because that, uh, doing that is, uh, you know, had the inner puffer fish hundreds of millions of years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, oh, let me show that picture too. This one? Well, oh, yeah, that, that one. I just wanted to. Uh, this one. What other, what, what other image of Lana that I wanted to uh, show? <laughs> that's <laughs> fun and sweet. We love that Lana, one. <laughs> Lana, if you had to put emotions on this, yeah. what would you say? It's a great question. Um, I'll show them which. I'm showing them the yeah. 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 Yeah, I uh, guess if I want to put emotions in this piece, yeah. I'm going to say... Um, like in the eyes, what emotions do you have? Or the, uh, or the, burning down. Or the whole image. Missing sadness. Uh -huh. That's what I thought. Is there any... No, I don't Not think yet. so. To me, it was like she's looking through trauma. <laughs> to me, it's yeah. like <laughs> looking out at me through trauma. Well, you can see the tears inside the eyes. The color she used to like. Yeah. Like it's caring. I think caring as well. Yeah, yeah. But you know, like, it's a small percentage in, in comparison with, like, the missing and the sadness, yeah. So, um, so one of the things we were talking about this afternoon was, um, is fun. And uh, here's, uh, Here's the image of Isdabar, and this was by Dr. Goen, and it appears in the Red Book. And in this image, uh, you can actually see Dr. Goen, he's this very little guy, and this is the giant Isdabar, who was an ancient god. And so I thought that for amusement's sake, I would read this exchange uh, between Isdabar and Dr. Jung, which took took place in his active imagination, and uh, so anyway, um, I'm going to read a, briefly from Jung's Red Book for our time, Searching for Soul under Postmodern Conditions, and I'm reading from an essay by Ingrid Rydell 
who is a European Union analyst and actually served as a pastor for 14 years. And so she's, she's both on the religious side and the psychological side. So she's talking about this image, which is image number 36. And here's what she says. Image 36 in the Red Book shows the huge giant Isdabar standing in front of a blue background filled with winged snakes. Here, maybe, Lana, could you hold this up? So, okay, so Neil's a tiny figure surrounded by crocodiles to the left and right side. This is Jung's eye who now addresses the giant. Okay, so I'm going to read the dialogue between the two. I, O Isdabar, most powerful, spare my life and forgive me for lying like a worm in your path. Isdabar, I do not want your life. Where do you come from? I, I come from the West. Isdabar, you come from the West? Do you know the Western lands? Is this the right way to the Western lands? I, I come from a Western land whose coasts wash against the Great Western Sea. Isdabar, does the sun sink in that sea or does it touch the solid land in its decline? I, the sun sinks far beyond the sea. Isdabar, beyond the sea? What lies there? I, there is nothing but empty space there. As you know, the earth sun is knowledge. So there is no immortal land where the sun goes down to be reborn. Are you speaking the truth? His eyes flicker with fear and fear. He steps a thundering pace closer. I tremble. Okay. Then, uh, um, when Jung's eye continues to talk about the sun as a celestial body that lies unspeakably far out in the unending space, Isdvar is seized by suffocating fear. To become immortal and to reach his sun is his deep desire, which now is shown to be impossible. In despair, Isdabar smashes his axe on a rock with a power, powerful clanging blow. Here a massive conflict between the scientific and the mythological worldview appears. Who of us has not experienced this conflict himself when the scientific mode of thought has collided with the faith given to us in our childhood, the belief in a God who would take care of us and guide us. Isdabar, the giant, now collapses and sobbed like a child. He lay stretched out on the ground, paralyzed by the poison of science. Isdabar, you call poison truth? Is poison truth or is truth poison? Do not our astrologers and priests also speak the truth? And yet theirs does not act like a poison. Isdabar, are there then two sorts of truth? Aye, it seems to be so. Our truth is that what comes to us from the knowledge of outer things, the truth of your priests, is that which comes to you from the inner things. Isdabar, half sitting up, that was a salutary word. After Jung's eye collects some wood and lights a fire, he and Isdabar continue their conversation while sitting in front of the flickering flames. Isdabar, have you no gods anymore? I, no words are all we have. Isdabar, but are these words powerful? I, so they claim, but one notices nothing of this. Isdabar, we do not see the gods either, and yet we believe they exist. We recognize their workings in natural events. I, science has taken from us the capacity of belief. Isdabar, what, you have lost that too? How then do you live? Okay, this goes on for a while, but uh, there's a amusing denouement here. Uh, so, Jung says, I, my prince, powerful one, listen, a thought came to me that might save us. I think you are not at all real, but only a fantasy. Isdabar, I am terrified by this thought. 
It is murderous. Do you even mean to declare me unreal? Now that now that you have now that you have lamed me so pitifully, I perhaps I have not made myself clear enough and have spoken too much in the language of the Western lands. I do not mean to say that you are not real at all, of course, but only as real as a fantasy. If you could accept this, much would be gained. Is to borrow. What would be gained by this? You are a tormenting devil. I, pitiful one, I will not torment you. The hand of the doctor does not seek to torment, even if it causes grief. Okay. In what magic do you want to entangle me? Should it help if help me if I take myself for a fantasy? Is to borrow. Or I. You also know that one often gives the sick new names to heal them, for with a new name they come by a new essence. Your name is your essence. Is to borrow. You are right, our priests also say this. I. So you are prepared to admit that you are a fantasy? Is to borrow. If it helps, yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, then Isdabar goes on. That was a masterstroke. Where are you carrying me? I'm going to carry you down into the Western lands. And um, so anyway, then the, the story goes on in the Red Book, but uh, we've been talking about this image of Isdabar. And um, what happens in Dr. Jung's active imagination is that he shrinks is is to bar done down in his active imagination from this giant that's in front of him down to something he can put in his pocket and carries him down into the western land lands as, as a fantasy or as a, the eros side any comments on that that's, that's really uh, what's wonderful about Active imagination is you can do anything you want. <laughs> and, um, you know, they do that in um, what is that stuff that uh, it just it made it reminded me how in one of the techniques you use in uh, NLP where you, you take, take the uh, image and the mental image and you shrink it down until it's small and then eventually you keep it's I can't remember how to do it now but that's if you remember that is the idea yeah uh -huh. um, so anyway the, the issue is the issue of logos and eros again and so for those of you who don't know I'm committing myself in the fall to give a formal lecture on finding the living God and um, part of this uh, part of your uh, podcast though? well it will be but it's I'm going to do it at Unity by the Bay probably in their sanctuary because uh, I, I want it to be video recorded in a in a sanctuary style place and of course they have a beautiful sanctuary and uh, so um, pardon well uh, yeah, if you want, and I, I was hoping for some input, <laughs> but, <laughs> so I'm asking my group here for input as well. Um, basically, um, we have on the on YouTube uh, a famous, now famous psychologist named Jordan Peterson, and Jordan Peterson has given a lot, a lot of talks including uh, 13 two-hour lectures on uh, the Old Testament as from a psychological perspective. Okay, and it's, it's brilliantly done in that way. But then Jordan Peterson got himself in a quandary because he wrote a book called The Twelve Rules of Life and he talks about it being a bulwark against chaos. So you have to have rules. Okay, so I got thinking about that, and I, I resisted the book originally and uh, did a, 
online critique of it some time ago. But I got to think about, thinking about it, and his whole perspective is to be on the Logos side. Okay, so in, um, in the Bible, in John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it seems to me that what theologians, both Protestant and Catholic theologians, have done is they've gotten into this habit of insisting on a logical argument. It has to be logical. It can't be illogical. It has to be rational, not irrational. It has to be logos, not eros. Okay, well, that's a problem. Okay, and it's a, it's a serious problem for Jordan Peterson because in his later videos now, you see his pain when he's asked, do you believe in God? And he hems and haws about it in multiple videos. And finally, he, puts, uh, he put at least one one hour and a half video lecture that he did called uh, How Dare Anybody Say They Believe in God, quote unquote and then a couple of other shorter videos that he did in the U.S., that lecture he had done in Australia. And, and, um, but you see his angst, angst. He, he's got very serious angst, and he just cannot bring himself to say that he believes in God. And, of course, a rationalist, somebody who is stuck on the logos, can't believe in God because they have to believe in words, right? Uh, and and um, so I, I really got to thinking about that, and it finally dawned on me that all logos, including all rules, all everything we learn, okay, it created civilization, but in the process it um, forced life out of things. Okay, go ahead. But he also won't say that he doesn't believe in God. Yeah, he doesn't say he doesn't believe in God. And some of the things he says sort of imply that he believes in God, but my point, I'm an attorney, and what I hear him saying is the same thing that I hear these th theologians that I know say, one Protestant and one Catholic, which is they, they give all the reasons why you should believe in God, like St. Augustine this and, and um, Origen that and all these rational arguments that have come down to us for the last 2,000 years about why you should believe in God. But for my lights as an attorney, I say this, these guys are making an oral argument like you would make to a jury. And so, okay, you can convince a jury that God exists and they'll go away from the jury box believing that what you said is right, but they will not have experienced God. And the experience of God comes from the other side, from Eros. So let's understand the difference between Logos and Eros. Everything in this room, everything that you can see, including the human beings, okay, was made perfectly because of Logos. Okay, we were all educated by the Logos. So we're here, Bill says we're not educated by the Logos. He's going to be my gadfly. Yeah, okay. You want to get fly? I'll be one. I haven't finished. First up, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, number one, the lawyers of God. I. That's everybody in the church. Every the law books. Here's the Bible. That's and, the logos, right? And that is logos. And the the problem with with logos and the, with these people is they're not. Their authority is in a book, and it's not in their own experience. And the experience involves so some sort of relationship and some sort of. Uh, some sort of, um, well, I, I like the rhizome idea, but the idea that there's something of which Logos is just a tiny subset, you know, our consciousness is so tiny compared to our unconscious, 
and and to believe that 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 film that impure film across the top of the the unconscious is all there is it's just absolutely absurd so there's there's this whole ocean that we don't understand and yet we can relate to it and it gives us understanding just because we can't we can't we can't slice it, it up and dice it up with right. logos doesn't mean that it's mm -hmm. you know okay so let, let let me just finish this so it's the experience that's far more important I that's why I don't know if this is tangential or similar or relevant but the reason I said he doesn't say he doesn't believe in God is that's where it seems like maybe the arrows comes in I mean something is not yeah. bringing him to he's not making it he's not admitting errors but well, it's he something keeping well, he him. doesn't but he also no says it's like what do you mean by meaning you know it depends on what you mean yeah. You know, and everybody so, has different meaning. Well, you know, yeah. What do you mean by belief? Depends belief? on what his what do you mean meaning is. He's a good lawyer, yeah. Clinton was a good lawyer, too. So there right. are, you have to cut through that. Right. Not everybody has the same Right. Meaning. So everything we say, including okay. everything we say at this table, is logos, right? right? And we need logos 100%. Because every product, every product on this no, table. See, when you say that, I don't necessarily agree. Because Why? Because if if I don't want to be a I don't want to be a wonk here, but you know, and I, you've got uh, first of all, this, these are your perceptions of what's about around us, and and the way we perceive things um, already. Uh, it, <laughs> Okay. I, 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 just let, let me complete my thought here. Okay, and then, then you can come at me. Okay, so the point is, every product has to be made by Logos, 100%. It has to be perfect. So just ask Boeing. Any product that you make has to be designed, it has to be drawn. What about, what about the guy in the first thing? Maybe I can fly. <laughs> Okay, let, just give me a chance here. Can I finish the second point? But every product ha first comes from fantasy or from imagination. Okay, so there, there's no product that we have here on this table or anywhere in this room that didn't come from fantasy first, including all the people, because we were all a glint in our father's eye before we were created. Pardon? Come from no, no, but fantasy and, and imagination come from Eros, is my point. Right? Okay. Huh? So they come from the other side, from Eros. Okay, and the point is that you can go to college all you want, and when you go out into life, you're going to have to live in the chaos, because there's there's... You can learn all these rules, you can, you can become a licensed professional and do all the necessary hoops, but in the end, you have, to, you have to live your life, and your life is lived in the chaos, in the Eros side, okay? And that's also where religion is, okay? And so the problem for somebody that's totally stuck on Logos is that he won't admit the arrows. It sneaks in every so often in what he says. But, but he can't say, I believe in God, because belief is believing a lawyer in an oral argument. Okay. So Jung said, I don't have to believe because I know. Okay, because I've had the experience. Right. So anyway, that all right. Well, no, I just believe. I mean, if it exists, it, it exists. So even though there's non-recognition of it, like it, one's recognition of something out loud does not equal what is. So that's right, because every every time we speak, we're already in the logos. Okay, and and we the existence yeah, is errors, in the logos. No, it's like it's I mean, like it feels like there's errors all over the place. It is. The, right, but um, you know the the question that's asked of Jodie Foster in the movie Contact is, um, do you love your mother? Okay, so prove it. Prove that you love your mother, right? 
and and so some things are ineffable. You can't you can't put them into words, right? And I might not even try to. I mean, why would I even bother to answer? Well, logos by its nature, in, 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 in terms of words, is a, a product. Language is a product. Right. Just like, just like the food, it, and it has to have a certain perfection in order to be transmitted. Right. So, so Bill, as an artist, has to experience something before he can do anything. Right? Well, no, making the arts an experience, sometimes that is the in experience. Itself, right, yeah. precisely. Right. And, right. and <laughs> some, sometimes, you, sometimes you can't explain everything about a work of art in words. You just no, I mean, you, you've person. obviously overlooked the fact that that's an egg. <laughs> well, it's an egg, and it's a mandala. That's right. Oh, right. That's a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. That's right. So getting back to your point about Jordan Peterson, and the living God. What, what, uh, what were you going to continue? Okay, so, so carrying on then, there's an interview or a discussion between Jordan Peterson and Bishop Barron, who's a Roman Catholic bishop, and he says in this discussion, I'm the chairman of a committee of bishops whose job it is, and what I say, can you imagine? All right. To bring 